Hi, this is Janos, it's Real World Audio, and uh, today I'm responding to Nick, and as you see, this is uh, really grossly overdue by almost a year. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. It's, uh, but as uh, you guys seen, this year is even crazier for me than my years in general, so it's really hard to get time for videos and, uh, and uh, question answers. Anyway, uh, now the time is uh, to is about uh, narrow directivity speakers. So Nick is asking to uh, he's brainstorming to find a solution for his uh, for a listening space that is of a smaller size and uh, he says the highest priority for the design of my loudspeaker is narrow directivity for two reasons one is the relatively small listening space i have other is that i want to experiment with cross talk cancellation technology which only comes into its own with as few reflections as much direct sound as possible so we want in a smaller space as much direct sound with as few reflections reaching you from the room itself as possible and uh, and let's let's just follow i do not like electrostats or magneto but have a love for high efficiency paper drivers and full range driver problem is that usually full range drivers have a very wide dispersion pattern Hence, I was thinking of a large horn for good directivity, perhaps with full range driver, but with compression drivers would also be possible. I am open to multiple small horns if you get better directivity, but I am afraid this will only get more complex, especially since I am relatively close to the speaker. But this was another reason why a single driver with a horn seemed right to me. Do you, maybe do you have suggestions? and uh, myself thought this design was in interesting by joseph crow number 1548 and um, let's have a look at uh, at joseph crow's uh, loudspeaker um, i will include the link to to his page here i looked it up and and as you see this is a really nice horn for a full range driver and uh, and as you see it's actually pretty big and uh, and it really comes to its own in a larger space that's where you can really uh, use it to its full i would say glory <laughs> but here you can see it. it can also be applied to as a smaller setting like in a smaller room you just uh, tow them in and uh, and i would say even if you just uh, place them in the corners that would also uh, increase their loading so then their frequency range could be more extended towards the base than than how they are and why am i talking about that is that because for horns the the low frequency limit of the horn is defined by the size of the horn mouth so in this case here uh, for lower low frequency i would say the the usable limit for low frequency would be ab about 50 hertz or so 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 these would be beautiful down to 50 hertz and there the horn just really fell, falls out it disappears to nothing unless you put it in the corner like 45 degrees in the corner pff, shooting in the front and then you use the room as an extension of that horn that's what Klipsch does with the Klipsch horn the big Klipsch horns uh, and uh, then you can get lower extension out of it but like in this setup here then you will be limited really about 50 hertz or so based on the horn mouth but i would say really strong down to about 100 hertz um, probably a little weaker down to 50 but still 50 still there and now is that a problem or not um, 
you you will get super efficient sound down to 50 hertz and that's just absolutely fantastic and if it's a smaller room then you don't really want to have the basic stand much lower than that because uh, I would rather have the extension a little bit limited by the speaker than limited by the room because when you have room limitation that's that to my ears I'm not happy with the sound when it happens when 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 the bass response is overloading the room that that's not something that is particularly desirable at least not for me there are some people who, for whom it's fine but for me that I, I am not someone who likes that and probably there's many who don't and uh, or there's some who even like that kind of sound but uh, it's not really anything that is helpful for anyone's audio journey because under audio journey I I mean a process where you become more aware of the sound how to connect with the sound and appreciate uh, unfolding more and more nuances about it and, and finding out ways how how you, we can connect to music and enjoy music and and find out what are those qualities that we are doing during sound reproduction that elevate this experience and uh, bring us more i would say more understanding and more connectivity versus solutions that are just quick pleasures like oh, just big amount of bass but compromised quality of bass so for me uh, what i would say for a productive audio journey is when you ramp up in one quality sound quality but you might increase a dip in the quantity so if if your bass is uh, higher in quality but it doesn't extend as low that is preferable than having a super low extension which is comparably much lower in quality uh, because it's not just the audio gear but your ear your ear is the number one you want to develop on your audio journey because if you don't if develop your ears developing the gear doesn't mean anything because you aren't able to even recognize whether you have taken a step forward or a step backward and by the time you figure out the way one figures out that I've been taking backward steps and I thought they are forward steps the way you realize it is that your hearing has been compromised <laughs> that you have lost uh, your hearing or aspects of your hearings and then when one does that it's super hard to gain it back and also when this process happens we are going in the wrong direction that also goes with dopamine addiction so we are creating a sound that just satisfies our pleasure center but it doesn't satisfy your brain processes how to kick them in a higher gear it kicks them into a lower gear so that we are more uh, lazy with the sound and uh, and when that happens that happens with some kind of sound that's overbearing overloading initially always we think that oh because it's hitting much more pleasure centers it, this is better but now this this is part of your audio journey then to differentiate between the sound making uh, overloading your senses in a bad way and when it's really giving you lasting good kind of pleasure not the cheap pleasure so so that's why audio is a really tough choice but these speakers i think these horns are a really excellent way um, to to get to the higher quality aspect so i think i have not heard these horns yet but uh, but based on what they are and and, and uh, similar things i think they are something that i would myself play around with and, and and recommend to try out it will be something fun 
but if you are looking for very low frequency extension it's not going to happen here at all but down to about 50 hertz they will be really satisfactory there's one thing why i myself would not do this design is that you cannot i at least i cannot build this myself and uh, that applies to everyone who doesn't have a cnc machine at home or doesn't have a cnc machine at one of his buddy's place or maybe uh, a cnc factory that you can access and uh, of course you have to make the plans <laughs> cnc plans so if you are not an engineer or uh, or architect type then uh, that's that's already a fail uh, but then you will have someone who make you the plans the cnc plans and then create this uh, with a cnc and um, yeah so there's more about that like right here cnc machine it's not not an easy thing but but if you have access to that and you have someone to uh, create the plans and i think that's that's the tougher part because it's easier to find a cnc plant than uh, coming up with the plans <laughs> uh, for that so there's two challenge making creating the plans for yourself and then uh, finding someone who who can cut it for you and uh, then I think this is a fantastic uh, fun idea and uh, yeah so coming back to the question or maybe do I have any other suggestions and uh, going back to to what you wrote I do agree yeah that's that in a smaller space the void pipes can be pretty much overloading uh, the room because of that uh, not, not narrow directivity but wide dispersion um, and uh, for a small room we can make uh, we, we could overcome that by wall loading uh, pipes and wall loading folded pipes I've noticed that it works uh, but then you will have a very different image uh, there's no more pinpoint image so that will be completely gone however the image that uh, we are getting like that wall loading uh, the folded void pipes is way more natural is much more like sound is in real life than the pinpoint imaging we have so I think uh, part of this audiophile persuasion is that uh, there's a balance between uh, achieving natural sound or what is on the recording and and what is on the recording is we really don't know we because uh, we just hear it by applying it to a, a sound system so and on every different sound system it sounds different and and we can't even say that uh, what is it that the recording engineer wanted because uh, it, it doesn't apply to anyone else other than the recording engineer what is on the recording is uh, is not just something that is applicable only with the recording engineer sound reproduction system in his own room acoustics uh, that just applies to the recording engineer what is on the recording is something that can be reproduced by every audio system in the world and um, and really for us the question is that how it is that I want to hear those recordings do I want to gear my system towards have like a, a extremely pinpoint representation which is uh, like a, a 3d illusion like a, like a, like an extreme 3d illusion which is not how the actual musical events are they are not 3d not those pinpoint 3d illusions uh, they are every object in life like like me talking it is not from pinpoint talking but uh, there's some sound coming from my mouth my chest is resonating so it's like a bigger area like like the size of those speakers behind me that big area resonating and, and giving off out sounds 
at different frequencies from each space with different timings. So it is it creates a diffuse sound here. But if if I were to recreate this with a really narrow directivity speaker that would represent my sound in this same room where I'm talking now in a very different perception. So even if the amplitude is perfect and, and, and the phase is perfect, um, it will still sound drastically different than how my sound sounds in this room. And that's why I myself, I am not into uh, just trying to get into this uh, pinpoint 3D hype or, or, or um, I'm not even calling it hype, but uh, an avenue or a path, like the pinpoint path. It's fun, it's interesting, but uh, it all but I've noticed on myself that uh, I find it fascinating for about an hour or so at most, but then I have to detox myself from it because it's so different from natural sound and it creates very different moods in my head compared to how natural sound sound and what the effect of the natural acoustics is. And um, so, so it's, it's really how we want to connect to music, what do we want from it, and, and just forget about all the uh, hype that the marketing people tell you that when you see the big commercials of a multi-million system and there's the engineer and says, that, oh, I am designed this for sonic perception and uh, this is how it, this is acoustically perfect and represents 100% what the recording engineer wanted and, and everyone else who did anything else is just in the middle ages that blah blah, blah nothing and uh, and that is um, I'm not saying that he is uh, he the product that he is selling is bad probably it has uh, wonderful features it certainly does have a unique way of presenting the sound is it the only way is it the best way uh, no it's not the only way is it the best way for him probably it is because he's really excited about it but you put 10 people in the room and there will be a few who will be also as excited as the person who created it or is selling it and there will be half of the room leaving that this sounds rubbish and this doesn't sound anything like a uh, real music sound but um, so so anyway I just said all of this that uh, the that the attempt to make like really high directivity sound it, it can really easily back us into such a corner mm, but it really also really highly depends on the room and and the system as well but one thing is for sure that if you have super high directivity sound then uh, you will have a really hard time much harder time to balance out your system because everything every tiny change you do will be uh, easily processed by your ear that is unnatural because it's ignoring the room and uh, and to a certain degree actually to as much degree as possible you want to include the room into the sound because that's what I noticed that the more the, the room is included to the sound no, it will not create the most showy sound, it won't create a hyper illusion, none of this, but that's the only way to create a sound that is acceptable for your human brain to make you believe that it's really happening in your room. So if it involves your room acoustics and maps your room and works with your room, then uh, it will create a kind of sound that will let you relax into the music and connect to the music at a much, much, much deeper level than uh, than the extreme resolution uh, type of imagery elicits from the brain. Um, and and talking about that, so uh, 
I will share something interesting that that might be an idea for you because you mentioned like multi, uh, trying out maybe multiple horns it can get really uh, complex what I've noticed uh, is that uh, you know there's my voice of Lancelot speakers which have the horn firing up and the and the woofer firing forward plus the port firing down and uh, that's a loudspeaker where I can get really I, I have placed the chair next to the speaker in front of the woofer so my ear faces the woofer basically and my ear is about this far away from the woofer and I can sit it like my ear directly at the woofer and I can even play it very loud and it will not be inconveniencing so it's not hurting the ear it won't sound unnatural um, and um, and that is also something that I'm, I'm pretty curious how th that maybe you could also try that in a small room to have like uh, really big cabinets and um, have the base by a base reflex cabinet and uh, have the woofer crossed over at 200 hertz and or maybe 300 hertz most so in the region that's quite below the uh, fine uh, mm, spatial discriminatory region of the brain which is like above 500 hertz so have it like crossed below 500 hertz and have the compression driver or drivers fire up above 500 hertz and that is something uh, that might be a solution so I think when we have such a small room and, and lots of problems with the reflections from the room is that there is a extreme discrepancy between the direct sound and the reflected sound and, and then if we just beam everything to the roof to the ceiling and that's where the mid-range and the high frequencies come to you all of them exclusively as reflections then it, there won't be this dichotomy of direct versus reflected where there's like a, a total major night and day difference between the two just only the reflected and then uh, that will create the maximum level of naturalness that's aware that's breachable in your acoustic space it will not be the highest level of uh, resolution but the highest level of naturalness so uh, maybe if you want to experiment with that i would certainly try that and i and uh, and if i had a cnc access i would also try that joseph crow uh, design there so nick i don't know probably you have already built something in the past 11 months but if not then uh, have fun and uh, thank you for being so patient <laughs> 11 months wow okay i think that that's a record <laughs>